Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharad, founder and CEO of Centisum, and today's host for the webinar. We have a very interesting topic uh, for today. We are going to talk about AI and customer insights, specifically focusing on how AI can enable collaboration uh, between teams. Let me introduce the special guest, our AI mascot at Centisum, Kaju, the lovely Kaju. He's just 17 weeks and he doesn't like to join these meetings but somehow i've convinced him to trace us with his presence for maybe 30 seconds or maybe a minute <laughs> i think uh, this webinar will be incomplete considering we are talking about partner box and okay he's distracting so i think i'm going to just head back to my seat okay kaju thank you so much now you can go back to your bed Thank you. So let's uh, kick off. Let's introduce our amazing guest, Selen from Partner Box. Selen, do you mind introducing yourself to our guest, please? Oh, I'm Selen Riantino, the Insights Lead of Partner Box. Partner Box, for those who don't know, is the fresh dog food company. Um, what that means in practice is that we produce and sell D2C fresh dog food which is quite natural, no nasties, healthier than what you'd expect to find in the market, and deliver it to people's houses um, every day. We're based in the UK. We operate in five markets. Um, I, I do insights for a series of, of teams, as we will touch during our conversation, and across all these markets. Thank you so much, Selene, for joining our webinar. Thanks. So we will be top covering a few interesting topics. First is uh, the world of customer insights at Butternut Box before they implemented AI. And then we will also touch on what sparked uh, use of AI at Butternut Box. We'll cover another interesting topic, which is how did Selene manage to get the budget, convey the leadership and others. And obviously, we are going to talk about some interesting results before we deep dive into these things i think it will be good to do a fun rapid fire questions so that we get a chance to know selene a bit better ready selene yeah easy ones easy ones so let's start with are you a dog person or a cat person ah, that's not an easy one just a dog, just a dog. Uh, no i would say both generally both it's like they're so unique and different cats and dogs that would go with both sorry for not picking one okay okay we can live with this <laughs> night person or you prefer early mornings early morning person it wasn't it wasn't the case until a few years ago and when you're brainstorming interesting ideas what do you prefer tea coffee wine or nothing <laughs> coffee. that's yeah, that's good to know what's your favorite food or cuisine Ooh. Although that's easy, like it's definitely Italian. Italian <laughs> favorite food, baked Italian pasta. Yeah, you can't beat that. Last one, because we are going to talk about AI. What's one myth about AI which you would want to debunk? Yeah, interesting question, especially foods. <laughs> but one that is pretty close to my heart and probably relevant for this conversation is the myth that AI is a replacement, especially a replacement of insight professionals or job or function. Yeah, what I've learned so far and yeah. since far is, is quite the opposite, is a great opportunity for us. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's so relevant, especially in 2023, because even if you just rewind three months ago, or four months ago, when everyone was talking about Gen AI, chat GPT, all the jobs are gone, companies will be dead, it's just going to be chat GPT, nothing else. Yeah, exactly. And it went through everybody's minds, so I think it's fair to say. I was sitting there, I remember the beginning of the year, exactly wondering what, what will it mean? It, will it be something positive, negative? It felt all like very black and white. Yeah, the myth for me is that it's black and white, but yeah. it's not. Yeah, cool, perfect. Thank you so much, Salen. Let's, shall we dig in? Yeah, go for it. Let's rewind a bit, maybe uh, not a bit, uh, to 2021, basically, right? When yeah. let's talk about the the kind of uh, the workflow, the processes, the customer insights, challenges you had in 2021 before you decided to kind of uh, look at AI. Yes, <laughs> looking back, like a couple of years is always 
the good exercise and interesting, especially towards the end of the year. I think, again, for the relevance of this conversation, yep. it's fair to say there were two aspects of our insight function already in 2021 that were, on one end, we had, and we still have, several surveys, always mm. on surveys, that will measure things like standard NPS, yeah. CSAT, all the various good old customer uh, experience metrics. We had a lot of processes around mainly the analysis of those surveys. Mm. And what that looked like was very manual analysis. Uh, I think that's very common in the industry, but there was literally me once a month in particular doing a deep dive into the responses that customers will kindly share with us about their experience at different stages of their journey with us. And then kind of creating reports, monthly reports that would both talk about the trends in our CX score, yeah. as well as uh, the underlying kind of reasons for it. I guess the chart thinking about it was that talking about the underlying reasons and trying to explain mm -hmm. the movements that we were observing in our CX metrics not only was quite time consuming, right. but it was also prone to bias because it was human. My eyes in this case, looking into people's responses, thousands mm -hmm. of uh, pieces of customer feedback on a regular basis. So there was one, the mm -hmm. other kind of thing, oh, beginning of a process that we had was related to customer support tickets, what we call customer contacts. Yeah. In 2021, we already had a fantastic customer love team who already had loads of different types of conversations with customers through different channels, and they would manually tag in the topics of these conversations and exchanges with customers. We had a Slack channel where right. basically on a daily basis, member of the customer love team would upload, pick and choose extracts mm -hmm. of customers' conversations or pieces of feedback and uploaded them in order to create momentum or keep momentum going around the things that really matter to customers and what we need to improve at any given time. So we had these two work streams, but interestingly, or very differently from today, they didn't speak to one another. We had sources, sources of solicited feedback analyzed manually and the precious sources of unsolicited feedback untapped. So yeah. we were not using it um, to define our CX programs. So yeah. that was the situation at the time. I remember I did the demo to you in 2021. I remember you mentioning these challenges and it's so interesting. And this is something which I hear in almost every conversations so much in just on NPS analysis, understanding drivers of NPS, going through manual analysis and completely ignoring, as you said, unsolicited feedback, which in customer support conversations, such massive volume of data. I mean, we call it, it's gold mine of insights and plus, yeah, so credit to you to see that, yeah, we need to bring all this together and automate it. Thank you for sharing that. My next question related to this will be, what intrigued you that you should look at AI or an AI enabled tool to address both of these challenges? Yeah, again, good question, because unlike today, where it very much feels yeah. like the word AI has to be thrown in every conversation, <laughs> exactly. at the time, my mind was, especially at the beginning, very much in a, a practical space, which was, mm. all right. This analysis of NPS and CX metrics is very time consuming. So mm. first of all, generally my attention was going towards something technology, of course, that would have helped me <laughs> in not only analyzing more quickly the sources of insights coming from CX uh, surveys, but also kind of analyzing them in real time. So. That's why I'm thinking about technology, because I, I wouldn't wish to anybody to do manual analysis on a daily basis of surveys, to be honest. So I was experiencing already at the time in the way we used to do insights, just for background, it was me 
insights person talking to all the other teams, product strategy, marketing, and so on, to make the case for prioritizing certain interventions, certain changes to our product and services. In the course of those conversations, it was striking for me what was missing. That is basically the ability to go to number-driven people, fundamentally, and say, the reason why we need to prioritize this, the reason why this matters most is because showing trends, showing charts, basically quantifying. Yeah. Yeah. And last but not least, I was very concerned of the, the fact that by analyzing all sources of insight, even the, the unsolicited customer uh, conversations with customer love, by analyzing them, as human beings with our own storytelling and preconceptions and ideas, we may have missed emerging trends. What I mean by that is like early signs that there are new, different needs or expectations in our customer base that we don't even know are there. So it's like, you don't know what you don't know. And my feeling was that by automating and having a system to spot and tag, identify trends, Without that human bias, we would have got a step closer to that emerging signal kind of spotting. Yeah, that's that's spot on. I, again, for, I quite resonate with these things because this is what I hear in a lot of my sales meetings. And one of them is basically that CX leaders like yourself, they kind of largely know the issues basically that you are having, the areas of improvements. But the biggest struggle is how do you exactly quantify how big or small the issue is and what's the impact. So that is amazing. I have another question, which is, I think, very interesting and very relevant, especially in today's time. And that is, how did you convince the leadership for the budget and the ROI? How did you create that business case? It was a combination of being very practical in the arguments we made in our business case. And again, number driven, so quantifying the, the benefits as well as just the right convergence of needs. We had the customer love team that was thinking more and more about testing ways to automate that tagging mm -hmm. process, because imagine like there are people that spend between 30 seconds and a minute per call on average or customer conversation to then go and tag yeah. manually and then generate a report. So. The core of our argument in the business case was very much about time saved, my time in manual analysis, the time saved to the members of the customer love team, and the equivalent financial savings that were result from that. As I said, there was generally the conversation internally, would it make sense to hire somebody that does these types of analysis compared to just implementing a tool? That was easy to address as a option because in reality, the technology is way more scalable besides the human ethics, like giving that type of job yeah. to anybody. So yeah, it was a combination of time saved, financial savings, and the fact that few different teams were coming together and thinking that it was just the right time to shift our processes, improve our processes. Interesting. We are talking about 2021 when no one was talking about AI like everyone is talking now. There is so much awareness among leadership to leverage AI. So you you took the kind of root of the time you can save and the things you can do with that time saved, basically, that can be great ROI. And how did kind of that evolve over time that was for the first year then came the renewals basically right so how did it did that argument change over time yeah it's fascinating how the scope of that argument and the easiness to make that argument has increased over time so the more we use the technology mm -hmm. the more embedded it becomes in our ways of working the easier it is to make the case not just for things like we're going to save extra number of hours um, on our analysis or tagging, but things like the what ifs, the other things we can improve that can be quantified. An example of that is the, today, we're going to touch upon that later, but like we know that 
a platform like Centism is embedded in the ways in which, for example, quarterly, we sit down and we think about um, our priorities and our roadmaps and the way in which we inform those roadmaps. And the time it saves us, again, going back to that, mm. in like running um, ad hoc, always new pieces of research, because we have this huge repository of data we analyze on a daily basis. So it's definitely become easier to the point that right now, like when we started in 2021, we were just analyzing, integrating basically the sources of insights in the UK or for the UK market. Now we've gone from one country to four countries. They're all analyzed in a consistent, compatible way in the platform. It's great to have also the translation capability in the platform. So again, once it's a snowball effect. You now, once more people use it, once it becomes embedded in the ways of working, then yeah, it becomes easier and easier to make that argument. That, that's very helpful. Any advice you have for people in your kind of similar situations with respect to they want to take their kind of insights forward. They want to implement uh, some tool so that they can save time, so that they can have strategic insights. But they're struggling with ROI conversations, especially in, in, in today's environment. Do you have any kind of advice how they should approach? It's tricky that ROI of insights in general. I, I swear to say many of us probably attend a webinar per month about it where somebody is trying to explain us how to do it. It's very much linked to what we're saying. There is a combination of the immediate savings in terms of saving, the immediate savings related to the analysis, as well as the harder to quantify, but intuitive enough argument related to how much a tool that allows you to quantify the most important drive, the most negative, the most positive drivers to your customer experience then help you be prioritizing the retention, the growth initiatives to carry out. So it's, it's a more of an efficiency argument, but that, that's effective enough in our case. And we're lucky enough, I mean, to be realistic in the case of this conversation, we're lucky enough also because we are a D2C. You know, D2C means that there's no room for disruption or disappointment of the customer and the customer experience. But there's nowhere to hide. So I'm lucky enough to work a button now where people are already in tune with the idea that a customer comes first. Whatever helps us to put the voice of the customer at the center of our processes, then it's, that's welcome. Yeah. When do you use NPS Insights and when do you use Insights from support conversations? Great question. It's been a journey, a learning journey. Mm. And we've tried different things and I generally don't think we've landed on the perfect solution and it's not going to change any set in stone. Even before starting uh, using Centism or AI type of analysis, I was already reporting monthly. So when do I use MPS Insight? It is monthly, like the answer is, and same with support conversations. Monthly in the context of reports that are sent to the entire business, including the leadership team. And in this report, I make the effort to bring together the insights from MPS and the insights from support conversations and see if and how they build a story or a picture. The, the, the cool thing is when they don't is when we're seeing certain things in MPS inside, yeah. certain other in support conversations, because that means there is some ambiguity there that we can then investigate further with other types of research. Because it's fair to say that this is just an element of our research methodology. But in the case of also NPS insights and specifically the drivers of NPS, things like, hey, these are the the aspects of the customer experience that are improving or worsening, or these are the best ones and these are the worst ones. I'm using them more and more in the context of ad hoc conversation. For example, the commercial team has noticed a change in the retention trend and they're wondering why is that? And mm -hmm. they're going through all the behavioral analytics to try and dive into that trend change. That's the, a great forum to bring the insights about the 
changes in the drivers in the MPS to try and answer the question why we see a change in retention. So that's another forum is like ad hoc using and to the point earlier of that's the value of having an always on real time analytics. You can always go and see the freshest, latest picture of what's driving your MPS. If you notice, there are many more answers in the MPS Insight space than in the support conversations. There's so much more we can do in the latter. Well, we have another interesting question. How engaged are your stakeholders with your insights? It's a great question. Yeah, yeah it's a great <laughs> the question. Point, the point uh, before, it's been a journey. Today, if I had to simplify who are my insight stakeholders, by and large, six. Six or seven main teams. I would say 50% of them are really engaged. And for me, engagement is in this case, they are active users of and consumers of those insights in the sense that they, if they have questions in their mind, they just go on the platform and see what's going on in the case of like MPS, the support conversations and so on as well as they get in touch proactively to know what we're seeing in the in our analysis. So that is the level of engagement I'm aiming for. Like active users that are also proactively seeking out. They're not sitting and waiting for my report. The other 50% is fairly engaged in the sense that yes, they are very open and actually they're interested in reading monthly the report and commenting and asking questions to it but yeah it's more about waiting for those reports it depends also on the nature of the stakeholders i personally find that bedding or creating engagement so investing my time really in strengthening the collaboration with product teams commercial teams marketing teams is the thing that really makes insights actionable so i focused on them there's much more i can do other team by like NEPD, for example. So it's been it's been a while you have been using this new way to look at customer insights, integrating with customer support conversations, automating it. How has this kind of impacted collaboration with other teams? Because we all know as a company grows, the bigger it becomes, the bigger the problem of silos we get, right? Different teams having their own version of customers insights, their own tools. Yeah. Definitely positively for the reasons mentioned, but yes, my role and the role of insight in general has changed for the better mm-hmm. in the sense that when coming to a meeting or spending time or having time actually to right. focus on disseminating the results of the analysis rather than spending 80% of my time, for example, running the analysis, I can be an actual partner, if we had to use business jargon, an actual strategic partner to the different teams. So whether it is once a week in the context of reviews of our A-B test performance or in the context of specific like marketing, new marketing and brand campaigns, now the collaboration is closer because I'm spending much more time disseminating the insights that the, the platform is analyzing. I think for me, the most exciting shift has been very much in the space of prioritizing. I don't know many companies in the consumer good industry that don't like to think of themselves as customer centric mm. and customer driven, but that's really hard to do. So. The collaboration, the main type of collaboration we've got right now is that, first of all, we have pods. So we have our product teams, commercial teams, marketing team, brand teams, all working together at different stages of the customer. I mean, once, for example, the confidence in Centism and the analysis we were getting through Centism reached the optimal level, we created specific customer experience metrics as goals or objectives of our different pods. So that means that now the collaboration that happens between product, commercial, marketing team and so on happens not just for the sake of driving cold metrics like conversion, retention, acquisitions, things like that. Also, whether it's MPS, 
whether it is value for money, whether it is the easiness and the unboxing experience. And that, that's been beautiful to say because then you see these people using those metrics and those drivers to, to prioritize the items on their roadmaps. Got it. That's very interesting. Any, any specific theme where you didn't expect, expect that level of collaboration, but you were surprised or you were not collaborating with them before so much? I think it is. I would have expected and I expected more engagement from the marketing team. And by marketing, I also mean commercial teams, just because, you know, it's part of a marketer. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. That is there and it's still there. But yeah, the, um, the type of engagement I got from the more technical, like product engineering type of teams, it's quite beautiful. It's quite fascinating to see. So having conversations about, I don't know, yeah, pure product engineering ticket right. items to, to prioritize or how to build them and what to build and so on. And mm. not saying that these people and teams mm. are really in tune to the drivers or how that will affect the, the customer experience and making sure that we check once we launch the new iteration or the new test, how that has landed with the customers is such a big win. So yeah, I didn't necessarily see it coming, but it's... Got it. That's good to know. Well, we have a very relevant question from Tessa. The question is, do you have any examples where you have utilized insights to drive ideas or requests with your other teams, something like product team? In the case of Button and Box, we are a subscription sir. We personalized the diet, the products yeah. that we sell uh, to customers out of a series of information that customers kind of give us uh, about their dogs. And um, one thing on which we've always been trading and finding the perfect balance is variety of choice. In the digital space, convenience in many cases looks like almost removing choice from people now if it's yep. easy to use if it's convenient yep. then minimum choice get people move quickly through whatever is the journey mm -hmm. we have in mind well you have the other end of the spectrum which is the marketing team saying oh variety really matters to people choice really matters to people you need to give as much choice as possible now, how do you go about knowing what's the optimal level of choice? So an example I have in mind is that at some point last year, we rolled out an A-B test related to finding this optimal level of choice, where we were restricting a bit more choice compared to what we had before, compared to the control. Now, interestingly, when we looked at the impact of that test, we didn't see any signs in our retention metrics, conversion metrics, mm. could point to any issues whatsoever. So on paper, the, the variant was just fine. Not necessarily successful, but we didn't spot anything. So I guess in that sense, the product team could have gone away and thought that had been a successful enough test. What was the game changer? We're analyzing just out of the blue. It wasn't part of our process at the time. But we just thought, let's take a look at what customers belonging to the two different cohorts are saying about their experience. And let's see whether there are patterns there or anything that can, you know, augment our understanding of how this test is landed. And that's where we discovered the whole world of actually there is an optimal level of choice. People that had been put in a certain bucket than the other and so on so that conversation led first of all to us switching off the test which is something that normally the product team would have not done based on commercial kpis which were the success metrics for that test but it was the first time that we thought actually cx metrics matter as well but also the learnings that we could extract from the actual voice of the customer from the survey helped us iterating. So we created an alternative. It's been extremely successful ever since. So uh, that was very, very interesting, actually. Never thought about. That goes back to your point you were making that uh, sometimes uh, we make a lot of assumptions and we live with our own biases and think that we have all the data points. So yeah, yeah very interesting. Thanks, Tessa, for the lovely question. In addition to collaboration, 
Shall we do another quick rapid fire question? Let's do that. Okay, so in a movie about buttoned box AI journey, yeah. who plays you? All right, ambitious, but I would say something like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, so he's here, McKellen. Ambitious. Okay. But yeah, the idea of like bringing a company together and like group of people towards common goal. Next question, what piece of advice you would have for companies or insights professionals looking or maybe hesitant about AI? I want this answer in maybe four words or maybe three words. I think, yeah, just get your hands dirty. Just do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Before we transition to that section, biggest AI win at Butternut Box. I, I won't restrict the number of words, but yeah. Above and beyond all the things said, I think for me, for me as an insight person, but like somebody who is just passionate about other humans <laughs> and understanding them, I think counterintuitively has been the empathy. Like mm -hmm. having a tool, having a tool that does all the analysis for us and make it easier for makes it easier for us to spot trends and delve into numbers and things created and nurtured actually the space for even more curiosity right. about what people are saying and what people are thinking and the reasons why they're doing what they're doing and the reasons why we're seeing certain KPIs and trends in our commercial analytics and so on. So if anything, and I would expand this to beyond the insights as a function, that's just my perspective on this AI hype think that is going on but also the, the the progress in the industry in general is that now more than ever people are in tune and really appreciative and really valuing right. a human element the voice of the customer for real so yeah the biggest win is that we've both embedded empathy as a process at scale also created space for even more curiosity which translates in research and like qualitative research and all the other things that we do as spin off. Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah, that's good to know. And considering Butner Box, where empathy is such a core brand value, I would say. So I think it's a, it's a good friend. Let's uh, move to our last section, continuing on the benefits you were mentioning around collaboration. Are there any other tangible benefits or even non tangible benefits you saw? The great thing for us has been this just new way of working. Okay, let's use the word AI as well, has resulted in improvements both in practical day to day and strategic. In the case of the strategic, beginning of 2022, coming out of pandemic lockdown and whatnot. So internally, we had at the time a really good sense of all the, the pain points in our customer experience and the things that were going well. There was a good sense. This is before the word cost of living crisis or the expression became such a popular thing. There was already the feeling that uh, getting better or very much focusing on conveying, delivering, demonstrating value to our customers would have been more important than ever as a brand, as a brand in our space, but in general. Now, the, where the shift happened was that going from conversations about, oh, maybe like things like value for money or adding value and so on are going to be relevant this year in the context of our we moved to a space where in the course of just a month we had people in brand marketing product uh, nepd strategy coming together and be like we really need to make this a theme of mm. this what had changed is that for the first time we were able to see how much value a driver of our CX, of our experience, of our MPS, of our CSAT. Um, the way we did it was through Sentism. Before we used to just have these conversations, but going to the point um, that we made earlier about the power of quantifying things. When we started seeing how many people had this idea of value more and more top of mind, so the emerging trend there. 
and what they were saying and what were the characteristics of these people that were mentioned in it and so on. All of that made it very easy for me to make the case for just coalescing all our team's efforts around this value team and adding wow. value team. The result has been brand campaigns, changes, significant and very successful changes to our sign-up flow, to the things, the aspects that we measure and we feed back to customers in terms of tangible benefits that we are delivering. So it's not something that wasn't there, but the momentum that we've created around the idea that is important to deliver and to communicate value in a certain way to our customer was a game changer. And ever since we work on this topic on an annual basis with loads of teams coming together. So it's very much a cross-functional piece of work. This is amazing. I'm so glad to know about this. Now, I think we have covered all the points we kind of wanted to cover today. I think this has been quite a interesting conversation we got some really good i should call it golden nuggets basically 